Hi, I'm Dr. Leah Monday from Wayne State University Division of Infectious Disease. And I want to thank you, as well as Dr. Bakowitz, for inviting me to do this 8 and 8 series on antibiotics and cardiothoracic surgery. The idea that giving antibiotics prior to surgery could reduce post-op infections first gained traction in the 60s, was prospectively studied through the 90s, and then ultimately culminated in the SCIP recommendations in 2006. Historically, the rates of consistent pre-op antibiotics were actually quite low, if you can believe it, even into the early 2000s, but now they're upwards of 95% at most centers because of these recommendations. The goal for most, including the commonly used beta-lactams like ANCEF, is to give these within one hour of cut time. Drugs like vancomycin and quinolones are given two hours prior to incision because they take a longer time to infuse. Where this process really varies for the surgeon is related to the antibiotic selection. Ideally, we want to cover the most probable bacteria we're going to encounter while not being overly broad and contributing to resistance. So the recommendation really varies by procedure. So for a colonic surgery or a GU surgery where we need to cover not only the skin organisms like staph and strep, but also enteric anaerobic gram negatives like BFRAG, you see beta-lactamase, beta-lactamase inhibitor combinations being used or acephalosporin plus flagyl being used. Whereas in regards to CT surgery, more than half of the surgical site infections of the sternal wound and the underlying mediastinum are due to staph aureus or coagulase negative staph, like staph epi, staph hominis, et cetera. And so these are the organisms we really want to focus on covering. Now, vancomycin is an appropriate substitute in the setting of an ANCEF allergy, but oftentimes these are actually both given together at major CT surgery centers due to either the high risk of MRSA in the city or because the OR itself is getting, doing a surgery with a prosthetic valve or graft that necessitates MRSA coverage because of that risk with a prosthesis. So you might be wondering if, you know, staph and strep are what we're covering and we're giving vancomycin for most CT surgeries anyway, why don't we just give vancomycin alone? Why do we give ANCEF with it? And the answer is really best explained in detail in your STS practice guidelines, as well as some guidelines from the American Society of Hospital Pharmacy. And basically in randomized control trials where they gave Vanco alone and compared it to ANCEF, it was better at preventing post-operative MRSA, but it was worse at protecting for MSSA. And additionally, we already know from the staph bacteremia literature and ID that it's inferior to ANCEF for MSSA. It's narrower, it has slightly less desirable pharmacokinetics and inferior tissue and bone penetration. So for that reason, um, centers in high concern for MRSA or doing procedures with prosthesis, we give vancomycin in addition to ANCEF. Next about when to cover pseudomonas. You guys all know your workhorse pseudomonas an uh, antibiotics are generally stefepime or zosin. You might notice there are some cardiothoracic procedures where an anti-pseudomonal is being given. So this is covered again in the thoracic surgery guidelines and what includes procedures like LVAD insertions or heart and lung transplants. Why? Because these patients really have high risk of constant healthcare exposure prior to those surgeries and they're getting manipulation of the pulmonary vasculature and the pulmonary um, area where a lot of these empiric um, uh, non-fermenting gram negatives are already colonizing. So the ideal agent is cefepime, although as treonam can be used in the setting of allergy. We generally don't use zosin for this purpose since it's overly broad and also covers the enteric gram negatives I mentioned before. Now, how long after surgery do we keep the antibiotics going? In general, uh, they're not really of benefit for more than a few hours after the incision is closed, but the risk of C. diff does, does go up the longer we give them. So in regards to CT surgery, the STS guidelines state that there's no reason to extend these beyond 48 hours after cardiac surgery, and they very explicitly state that they shouldn't be extended beyond 48 hours, even when there's tubes and drains in place. But the question of how long you give antibiotics after chest tube insertion when someone comes out of the OR with a chest tube is actually a really interesting topic I want to um, briefly touch on. So when someone leaves the OR with a chest tube, obviously there's now a prosthetic drain and a sterile body cavity communicating with the outside world, including the bed and the ICU. So this provokes some anxiety. Um, it's common to see people give antibiotics after chest tubes are put in in the OR for a range of times. And there was actually a randomized controlled trial done on this in 2013 by the surgeons at Harvard. 
And they gave either ANSAF or placebo for 48 hours after chest tube insertion or until the tube came out and tracked the combined incidence of the tube site infection, empyema, and pneumonia afterward. And what they found was that extending those antibiotics into the two days after surgery was of no value of preventing infectious complications. But there are some notable critiques to this study. First of all, these were mostly um, elective lobectomies. None of these were emergent chest tubes. And so these weren't patients who were very high risk of infection to begin with. They also had a very short median time to chest tube removal and overall length of stay. So perhaps it's just prop removal of a prosthetic device rather than post-op antibiotics um, to make that difference in this study. Ultimately, what you're going to see is that this varies by center. For example, I've seen at least two guidelines for major Michigan University centers that give antibiotics for 48 hours after a cabbage, but for 72 hours after a lung transplant when unless the chest tubes are removed sooner. So you'll see different practices depending on where you train, but I want you to be aware of what the literature says and what your STS guidelines say. And keep in mind, there's also studies looking at this in trauma patients, including a big meta-analysis in 2022, but that was at the giving antibiotics at the time of insertion, not necessarily looking at duration. So I think really this is a very interesting topic of study and would be a great um, fellows research project to look at in your center. I'd like to touch quickly on topical antibiotics in the OR with wound irrigations in the operating room. It makes sense that, you know, historically surgeons have applied things topically to kill any organisms. And for antiseptics like betadine, you know, this makes sense. But for antibiotics, mechanistically, they really don't have enough contact time to do their mechanism of action on the ribosome or on some sort of desphosphorylation step in the phospholipid cell wall to really make this make pharmacologic sense. And the in vitro and in vivo clinical data really support this. So, you know, now a lot of this practice has been historical, but a 2017 meta-analysis of 21 studies really found, you know, no benefit of topical antibiotics. And most major studies, including a lot of surgical societies, uh, now recommend against this practice. There are two unique patient populations in CT surgery that Dr. Bakowitz wanted me to touch on where the topic of antibiotics arises. And, you know, one is the ECMO population. These patients are at super high risk of infection, not only from the circuit itself, but from other numerous indwelling catheters, central lines, ET, NG tubes, et cetera. Often these patients are already on broad antibiotics or they might be immunocompromised from lung disease or on steroids for shock or COVID. So rates of infection are variable in studies, but they're high in ECMO patients. One of the largest studies looking at this was an analysis of data from the um, ECMO registry uh, in 2011, looking back at patients from the 80s all the way through 2009 in about 3,000 adult patients, 21% of them had an infectious complication, and the risk factors included, not surprisingly, being on ECMO longer, being older, having a VA circuit, or having um, a positive culture prior to being on ECMO. Not surprisingly, the rates of non-fermenting gram-negatives like Pseudomonas and MRSA were high, and they increased by the decades studied as medicine has become more invasive. Um, overall, this task force recommends against prophylactic antibiotics on ECMO, but this practice varies widely when centers are surveyed about what they do with their practices. And really, also they vary about, you know, daily surveillance blood cultures, and there's no set rules about this. This is really difficult to study because such an incredibly small percentage of patients would be put on ECMO without already being on antibiotics for some other reason. And there's really a need for better data and better study in this area, including surveillance blood cultures. And again, I think this is a really ripe area for um, projects. The second population where this question arises is in patients who need delayed closure and leave the OR with an open chest. Currently, there's no recommendations guiding antibiotic prophylaxis in these patients. Um, there's not much data on this in the adult world. There are some retrospective studies in kids that have shown decreased incidence of sternal wound infection or bacteremia when you broaden the coverage after an open chest, but this really isn't well described overall in the literature. And even the retrospective studies that exist are comparing sort of continuation of standard pre-op antibiotics to strategies that broaden them, not really whether or not to give them. 
Um, one of the largest was review at a Cleveland clinic in 167 patients using broader gram negative agents and extending the duration, which didn't decrease the infection risk, but the patients did have higher risks of C. diff um, compared to the group who received an abbreviated course. So even more so than ECMO, the data in open chest are lacking. And I really think further studies are needed to compare not only the duration among various prophylactic strategies, but also to compare patients who do and do not get prophylaxis after an open chest and, you know, really see what the outcomes are. Um, however, the data we do have suggests that broad spectrum and extended durations may not exactly be warranted in this population. So in the end, I want to thank you for inviting me and always remember to reach out to your ID colleagues and work with us as a team. And thanks for letting me talk to you about antibiotics in the perioperative period. Thanks.